Hey everybody, welcome back to Jody Hughes Music. And in today's lesson, we're gonna talk about partial chords versus complete chords. And basically, I'm gonna show you why I start all of my students with two to three finger chords versus those pesky four finger chords. Um, and explain why I've kind of changed my teaching philosophy over the years and why I do this. So I even start people with two finger chords sometimes. But before I begin, I just want to say thank you to all of my subscribers out there and my Patreon members. And I've got two Patreon members I just want to give a big shout out to, and I got their names here, Robert Cooper. Yes, Robert Cooper, I think that's how it's pronounced. And Neil, thank you so much for your pledge. It means the world to me and you are greatly appreciated and you guys are super cool. All right, so let's go ahead and get into this video. So what are the two reasons that I usually tell people that why I start people with two to three finger chords? Number one, is I have found through years of teaching, I have a lot of students that sometimes that were self-taught, they've been teaching themselves for one or two years and they come in, they reach a plateau and they can't get any better, so to speak. And the number one reason that I don't start with four finger chords is what I've found is that when you get into those four finger chords is your fingers can become locked into place. And it seems almost irrational, but if you do those four finger chords and I ask you to do a three finger chord or a two finger chord, you'd have trouble seeing it, visualizing it, or even playing it. And we're gonna discuss in just a moment, I'm gonna demonstrate why you don't wanna always be locked into doing the complete shape to begin with. And then the second reason, which is probably the more important reason, is when you're first starting out, your fingers just are not ready for it. In particular, the ring finger on some of these stretching over to that four string, it has no flexibility yet. So you've gotta build that flexibility, and then if you just start with those four finger chords and you just, you can't do it, it's just gonna to lead to frustration. It's gonna to lead to you wanting to quit the banjo and we certainly don't want that. We want you to do things that are gonna be easy for you in the beginning and just step by step. So that's one reason that, you know, these books give you these chords, but they're not giving you a logical kind of step pathway to get there. It just kind of assumes that, hey buddy, you've been playing a musical instrument before, your fingers are ready for that. And the truth is, is very few students come in right off the street and are ready for that, you know, from day one, let's say. Another thing I'm gonna take you through in this video is I'm gonna explain why you need to be able to see all the little different combinations of these partial chords, meaning two finger uh, little shapes all over the neck of the instrument and being able to visualize these in addition to your four finger chords, in addition to your three finger chords, this is really gonna open up your playing. It's really gonna allow you to be able to move up and down the fingerboard and be basically ready for anything you might need to pl uh, play. And you're gonna find out that players like Don Reno, he used a lot of partial chord shapes with open strings. So those things are super important to his style in particular. Um, but yeah, the three finger chords are really a great way to just kind of begin. And one of the things that I learned through my own training with jazz and orchestration of classical music is sometimes if you have all the notes in there, the sounds can kind of become a bit muddy. So in particular, you're gonna see here in a minute that like if I do four finger chords way up on like say the 15th fret, that sometimes that bass is just a big thud and it's not really a beautiful sound. It's just kind of bleh, that kind of sound, I'm sorry. Uh, and so what we wanna do is create nice, clear voicings. And this is one thing that sometimes I feel like is not quite explored enough in bluegrass is simply the orchestration of the music. You know, if you have a bass player, you have a guitar player and they're down here in that low register and then you're also playing those same notes in the same frequency, it can get a little bit muddy. Or let's say you're playing with a mandolin player and they're literally in the same register as you playing those vamping chords and you're playing right along with them. And that, that those frequencies can collide and create kind of a muddy sound. And so sometimes, even with jazz, like the most complicated chords, let's say it's like a seven sharp 11 or something, you know, you don't want every single note in there. And it's because it becomes just kind of a big, you know, blur of, of sound. So sometimes for clarity, I'd even argue that those three finger chords are actually the best way to go anyways. Another reason that you may not want to start with those four finger chords is that fourth note is simply a doubling of the note anyways. So, you know, if you got, let's just look at your first chord there, uh, your first G chord there in third position, you got a G, you got a B, you got a D, and then you got another G on top. So if you don't play that four string fifth fret, no one's gonna even know that it was missing to start with if you're playing with other people. Uh, and I also argue, you know, going back to my jazz training as well, is they play a lot of rootless chords and sometimes even take the root out of chords. So your bass player's got that G covered. So if you just play the B and the D even, it's still going to sound like a G chord with a group. So just keep in mind that that four string is simply a doubling of the first string in a lot of cases with these four finger chords. So if you drop it out, once again, no one is going to know the difference. A lot of our perception and the way we teach banjo 
is kind of wrapped up in, of course, bluegrass banjo, which, of course, I teach a lot of. But it's also wrapped up into the way that Earl Scruggs, in particular, approach things. But you would notice that with Earl Scruggs is that those four-finger chords are primarily used in uh, accompaniment and backup. And there are some places where he uses them in lead playing, like Dear Old Dixie's a great example. But when we start playing lead banjo in melodies, you're going to want that other finger, your little ring finger here, a lot of times. That's not always the ring finger. It could be some other finger or your pinky. Uh, you're going to want that other finger to be free to jump in and out of the melody notes in the chord shapes. So that's what we're going to be talking about in this lesson. Okay, all aboard the uh, partial chord train here. So what I want to just tell you is this has just been my experience through teaching people throughout the years is I've had people come in once again that have been playing for years self-taught and they've locked themselves into this four finger shape that you see you know presented in say like the Scruggs book or a typical banjo chart and why I'm going to show you why this may not be the best place to start for you okay so what's going to happen and you'll see this even in Scruggs style playing is that when we accompany others and we play backup that we do a lot of four finger chords this sort of thing. And you'll see this, you know, we're moving around. You've heard that sound. But here's the problem, is when we go to play lead stuff, like, I don't know, I just... Uh, this other finger here, my ring finger, he needs to be able to jump in and out of melody notes. He needs to be able to move so basically the notes in the chord are here but there's notes in the melody that are not in the chord and by having that ring finger free and not locked here it's going to enable us to move around so i'm just going to kind of demonstrate here with some little licks and patterns now he could come over there and rest there but he could go right back up and then when i move to my d chord notice that he comes in so this guy has got to be free and able to move around. And I have no logical explanation other than the brain gets locked into doing stuff once you, you know, say, hey, buddy, this is the only way you can do it, is that people come in and they're locked into this and their fingers will not literally move to get to melody notes if they have done this so long. So one of the number one reasons I start people with three finger chords is because when you go to play melodies and lead, you're going to have to be able to do this. And I'll just demonstrate some more out of these chord shapes. So if I'm playing... Now go to the D shape. And even in backup stuff, you've got to be able to see partial shapes. Your bar chord, which I'm going to have a hard time doing because I cut my finger, but... So these other fingers have got to be free. They can't be locked into place. All right. So that's the number one reason that we want this to be able to float and move around. The other reason I'm going to argue too is that when you're first starting out, you know, you have trouble just coordinating one finger, much less. I mean, who do you think you guys trying to tell me to do four four fingers? I can't even get my pink, I can't get my ring finger to do what I what I needed to do. And you want me to do things with four fingers, man? Come on. It's a terrible place to start. So yeah, so my advice is to kind of have a baby step method to this. And even when I work with like little kids, let's say, for example, when you know their fingers can't do this sort of stuff. I have a kid right now that I'm teaching guitar to, you know, and I just started him with a one finger G chord. We've progressed to a two finger G chord and we're going to go to a three finger G chord and so forth. And I, I do the same thing with them. But I'm going to show you in a minute why these partial chords are so important as well. But let's just, you know, let's just take this chord. Maybe a better place for you to start is to simply just play this and this. And yeah, I know that it's not the complete chord, but you've got to start somewhere. You know, and you can just practice just doing this, and then as you can move this around and get this, then you can add in another finger. Let's just say this finger. And let's go to your G chord, your four finger chord. Well, maybe you could start with just the top three notes. And then you could just pluck those three. I actually do this all the time if I want a warmer sound as opposed to a clearer sound, just a, a nice. I'll 
I'll do the inside three strings. And that brings me to my next point. So what I want to do here is I want to show you the little combinations of little partial chords that you need to be able to see. And once again, I'll have a tab to this for my Patreon members so you can see that in the, that little area over there. So if we start with your four finger G chord, what are the two note possibilities? So you could play the fifth fret of the first string and the third fret. And you could even use this. I mean, you could use it like as a lick. It's like C and this is D. All right, what's next? Well, you could, let's go to this one and this one. And by the way, one of my favorite banjo players of all time was Don Reno. I've talked a lot about Don Reno. And he used these little shapes. I think I used that in just a closer walk with D. That's the first little chord shape there. So even this, and some of the things with Don Reno is he would like do this little shape and then leave the first string open, you know, something. So this is a G here. And even though you don't have the root in there, you have a B and you have a D, it's a third and a fifth. And I'm going to make the argument that, hey, your bass player's got the root. It doesn't have to be in there all the time. So a lot of times, like if I'm just playing back up or something, you know, I can... Or if I want it like in a lead part... create some ideas. I think even Don Reno, you know, you move it up to A, you get a suspension there. Um, kind of a suspension. Um, so you, yeah, you get that fourth in there with the A, but anyways, so there's these two notes. So you got these two, and you got these two, and then one of my favorites here is you can get this one. You can get the fourth fret of the third string and the fifth fret of the four, uh, fourth string there. And now, now I'm going to do an inside roll, four, three, two, again. And if, if you want this over, say, a C chord, you would move this up. Now, you may have trouble finding places to put some of this in your traditional, like, nine-pound hammer bluegrass song. I don't know. But I do say this, that a lot of times in backup, you know, I like these partial... Moving in and out like by half step. Maybe in a blues song or something, you have. You know. So there's something to be said about this. It's simply just a G and a B, so it's like a one and a third. Uh, if you don't already know this, the fifth is pretty non essential in that it doesn't determine if it's major or minor. So if you leave the fifth out, well, it still sounds like a chord. It still sounds like a G chord, even though technically it doesn't have all three notes. In particular, when you get a guitar, a mandolin, all these people playing all the notes of the chord, you don't need to necessarily spell out every single note in the chord. So a lot of times, you know, uh, once again, I got this from my jazz background in orchestration with classical music, is that sometimes I just want like just a piece of a chord. It's hard to demonstrate this without a whole live band with me, but these things are very useful. And sometimes they're very useful if you're playing particularly really fast. You know, you may not have time to get to this four finger chord and you may just do, you know, one or two notes. Another one that's super common, I totally skipped over this, is the fifth fret of the first string and the fourth fret. There are called sixes. And you've seen videos on this, people talk about this a lot. Uh, is these are particularly useful, like on a slow song. to D, okay? So you can use these. I like to just little interject these little sixes. Even that, it, it, like I said, it kind of sounds a little empty by myself, but if a full band was here, it would sound fine. Uh, you can do all sorts of things here with these little patterns. But just to kind of demonstrate, like I, you know, I'll take these little partial chord shapes there, and what I'm 
want to show you out of this position too is I'm simply taking the fourth string and the third string and I'm just playing those two and walking it down with a passing chord and then to here. C. You know, and let's go over to these two here. For, so like for G and then C. D, you could, maybe let's mix this up with like a bar chord so you have some variety, have a bar chord. And I'm just pinching three and two. And I'm moving it up. That's a D shape. There's, you know, there's the, the middle two strings on the D there. And maybe D7. And now to G. But what I'm kind of demonstrate here is just showing you what, or what you're capable with of a partial chords. like something maybe Don Reno would play perhaps. Um, but partial chords, man, there's so much stuff you can do with this. A song that I urge you to go learn that's uh, got some really cool little partial chord shapes that I play a lot is Theme Time. Uh, Bill Emerson and J.D. Crow did that song. That's a good one. Um, there's all sorts of, I mean, pretty much any Don Reno song, you can kind of see these little shapes. Those are really cool tunes that use those kind of things. But yeah, these are some partial chord shapes. And man, my advice is just to go exploring. I, I think it's beyond the scope of a single video to demonstrate like every single chord. But like, you know, if you took like an A chord, you know, you could just say, what are the combinations of two fingers that I can use there? You know, and there's your basic ones out of that. Let's go to an E chord. Okay, out of E. That's kind of a weird one. Sometimes people have trouble seeing that. But you're going to see this all throughout songs, and basically, in summary, your whole goal here is to be able to visualize any little pieces of the chord without having to make the full chord. And I find that that's one of the most difficult things for, quote, beginners to do, is they're so used to seeing the full shape that when I say, hey, just play out of the G, they say, what is that? Or maybe, you know, way down here somewhere, you know, we see this, it's just a D. You know, yeah, you're not playing the full D, but it's still, that's what it's fitting. That's uh, the guitar player strumming the whole chord. You're playing a piece of it. So you really need to be able to see these little fragments and pieces. Okay, so that just about wraps up a little partial chords. And I hope you got a lot out of the video. Uh, you know, go exploring. You don't have to do exactly every little exercise and thing that I'm doing in the video. The idea is to just give you some things to bounce off of and, and ideas to generate more ideas in your own head and overwhelm you. Uh, just kidding. Uh, but yes, if you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe. I love all of my subscribers. You are greatly appreciated. And the coolest people in the world are my Patreon members. You guys are so appreciated. And I'll have a tab in my Patreon section for some of these little partial chords. And I'll do a little write-up on it and things like that. But you guys take care and thank you so much for tuning in.